Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Retro RPG. And the winner of the poll this week was Shadowrun 3rd Edition by Fazza from 1998. Now, although Shadowrun was the clear leader of the poll from the very beginning, it didn't win by as massive a margin as many of the games in previous weeks. So, it was nice to see a bit more competition in there. But this competition also led to the not being a clear loser this week. So, although the Cyanix Handbook and Ramsey Candle Scopeswood ended up with 11% of the vote each, I'm not going to drop either of those, I'm going to keep them in. So, Shadowrun's going to be replaced this week, and I've decided to add Unknown Armies by Atlas Games from 1998 as well. Now, I don't think it's as famous a game as Shadowrun and many of the others in the polls, so I'll be intrigued to see if people want to know a bit more about it. But let's go over to the desktop and have a look at Shadowrun. So, this is Shadowrun 3rd Edition from Fazza in 1998. Now, this was the last edition published by Fazza themselves. After this, it was licensed out to other companies because Fazza went out of the game publishing uh, business. They became just a licensing company. And this was around about the time the Shadowrun game on the Xbox came out because they were just trying to license out the various things. So Microsoft was licensing Battletech, Shadowrun, and the role-playing games themselves got split up, which is why Shadowrun and Earthdawn diverged after this point. Now, putting my cards on the table here, Shadowrun 3rd Edition isn't one of my favourite versions of Shadowrun at all. And it's not down to the rules, because the rules are pretty solid. They have solved a lot of problems that were in 2nd Edition, some of which I'll go through as we flip through. But it's the artwork. Whereas I thought 1st Edition Shadowrun was an absolute work of art, 2nd Edition reused a lot of artwork, so it's still a very beautiful book. Third edition uses a lot of new artwork, and a lot of it I don't think suits the game. I think it's a bit silly, but it's really weird to be put off by the art style in a game when the game itself is what should matter. But I apparently am as petty as that. Anyway, let's have a look at the back cover before we start going through. Now this is the soft back version. Because, as I said, it's not one of my favourite ones. Every other edition of Shadowrun, I've got the hardbacks. But this one just never appealed to me enough to pay out the extra money to get the hardback version. Where man meets magic and machine. The year is 2060. Magic is as real as the mean streets of the mega sprawls. Corporations call the shots while nailing each other through covert operatives in cutthroat competition. Flesh and machines have merged. The street samurai with his smart guns and impossibly fast reflexes. The decker who can plug his own brain into the worldwide computer network. The rigger who links his mind to the vehicle, takes hairpin turns at fantastic speeds. And you're part of this wired world, where corporate skyscrapers glitter over the dark shadows they cast. You live in those shadows. You're a shadow runner, a street operative. You may be a human or troll, dwarf or elf. You may throw fireballs. Pull out your trusty Uzi or slice through computer security with a program as elegant and deadly as a stiletto. No matter what, you get the job done. You're a Shadowrunner, a professional. You don't just survive in the shadows, you thrive there, for now. Shadowrun 3rd Edition is a complete rulebook for games masters and players. It contains all the rules needed to create characters and ongoing adventures set in the popular Shadowrun universe. Shadowrun 3rd Edition updates, revises and expands and clarifies rules from previous Shadowrun rulebooks. It's compatible with previous versions of Shadowrun with previously published Shadowrun source material. Now, looking through it, we can see the publishing is of very high quality. Um, it's very nicely laid out. We've got a table of contents here, allowing us to find pretty much anything we're searching for. We've got the introduction to the game, explaining why They've brought out a new edition. They've incorporated various things from like Virtual Realities version 2, the Rigger book 2, uh, bringing it all into one core book. So you don't really need to have all those extra books anymore, which had become so essential that you not only have the rule book, but you've got three or four other source books detail out stuff. However, in reality, the rules in here are cut down a bit, so you probably are better off having those books, especially when the third edition versions came out. So what Shadowrunners do? Basic runner types. Deckers, mages, adults, adepts, uh, riggers, shamans, street samurai. 
Settings. Shadow is set on his 62 years in the future. Shadow activity. North America, circa 2060. So the original Shadowrun had come out and its setting was 2050. So the timeline of Shadowrun does move on as adventures are released. They do have an effect on the world. So this, by this point, 10 years of storyline had gone past and we had reached 2060. Now, 4th edition, I believe, covers the years up to like 2070, 2065, 2070. And 5th edition is set in 2070. Um, we've got a short story here, and so it came to pass, the history of the world. Now, I do think it's quite nice that I'm covering something to do with Shadowrun at the moment, because as we flip on a few pages, we reach Goblinization Day on the 30th of April 2021. All over the world, one out of every ten adults suddenly metamorphosed into hideous humanoid shapes. Soon the phenomenon started to affect children. Some were born monsters, while others changed soon after puberty. Um, the media, with unerring instinct for sensational buzzwords, dubbed the process goblinization. So, if you've noticed any of your neighbours looking a bit odd lately, it's because on 30th of April they goblinized. Um, new nations keeping score. This modern life. It's just detailing all the future through, up until we reach the time of Shadowrun. And we've got Bug City there, which was one of the major Shadowrun events during 2nd edition. Election fever, so the Dunkles and the uh, stuff that happened. Corporate war, 2060 and beyond. So we're all up to date. Now we're dealing with what a role-playing game is, or what Shadowrun is, how to play it. The abstract nature of rules. Making tests, just the basic rules. Skill tests here, various attributes. It's a large book, so I'm going to skip through. Now, while this artwork is kind of nice, why are we getting what looks to be an insect spirit of some kind just thrown in here? Um, cyberware, contacts, and then we're on to the metahumanity, the races. So we've got dwarves. Who's an interesting looking dwarf there? Elves. Well, doesn't look much different from a skinny human. Humans. We've got trolls, and we've got orcs. Now, while every other race looks all right, the orcs just look silly. That really looks goofy, uh, cartoon-like and ridiculous. Whereas the troll, I can see as a human who has metamorphosed. They've got the bone struts sticking out, creating their horns. They are grizzled as the mutations of goblinization have changed their body. The orc just looks silly and cartoon-like. I am not impressed, especially as the introduction to the species. I did notice that on the back cover they did actually ignore orcs. They mentioned all the other species. So we've got the character creation rules here, creating a Shadowrunner. Going through choosing your race, aspected magicians, mage or shaman, how to choose your attributes. Um, actually, if I flip back a second, they still use the priority system, which is a very nice version or a very nice system for generating characters. You can choose whether they're going to be a full mage and therefore get less attributes and skills than other, and whether you're going to choose a race as well, because trolls and elves are seen as more powerful than the other species. So you have to allocate priority points to them, which reduces the amount of resources, skills, and attributes you can have. Now, it's also worth bearing in mind that this is much improved from the older versions of Shadowrun, where resources also led to skill points. Because in Shadowrun 1st and 2nd edition, when you bought resources, you got amount of skill points. So when you're creating a mage, well, you spend your points in creating becoming a full magician, and then you want to have lots of spells. So you end up buying a lot of resource points. A mage is one of the ones which needs the least money. So, whereas a street samurai wants to buy lots of cybernetics, a rigger and decker want to buy vehicles or decks and programs, a mage really has no call for resources. They buy maybe a couple of spell locks, a spell focus, it doesn't swallow up their money. But in third edition, what it does is you spend some of that money on buying extra skill points. Everybody starts with a certain amount of skill points, 
Uh, all aspected magicians start off with 35 spell points. The cost to uh, purchase additional points is 25,000 per point to a maximum of 50 points. Um, adepts. I believe they get a similar amount. No, full magician, sorry, 25 points. Um, they spend them at a rate of 25,000 as well, up to 50 points. So your mages now get rid of some of the mo uh, money, some of their resources, in exchange for the spell points, instead of getting both. And that's a really good improvement, I have to say. It stops the very silly thing which happened endless times in campaigns I played in, where... The street samurai turns up having spent all their money on uh, cybernetics because it's far better to get them at the start of play than it is during play. And basically turn up with a pistol and taking the bus to their missions. Whereas the mage turns up owning a limousine because they started off with a million resources which they have to spend during character creation because they only get 10% of it as cash if they enter play with it. So they want to spend it on something expensive. So a half million uh, resources buying a limousine, that'll do me nicely. So they cruise around in big cars while everybody else is taking the bus to their missions because they have no cash. It was a little bit silly, and this helps resolve that to a certain degree. And we've got the racial modifications. So your attributes change depending on what species you are. Obviously, trolls get a massive bonus to their body and their strength. We've got the skills which have abandoned the skill web which is kind of sad I did like the way it worked to link skills together so having knowledge in a certain area gave you the ability to um, have knowledge or be able to do connected skills the skill web was a bit silly in that you could default from completely unrelated things so going through speak Japanese I think was the common one we always used to do explosives and things like that it's unrelated and a bit silly but it was nice to be able to use related skills instead of not um, having no ability whatsoever anyway we've got the skills here, dice pool calculations and then we've got a few sample uh, templates so we've got the adept we've got the combat decker who again is an orc and looks stupid it's ridiculous. We've got the Combat Mage, a very nice piece of artwork. Covert Ops Specialist. Drone Rigger. Investigator, who's an orc, who does look really good. I have to say, I like that style. An orc Sherlock Holmes kind of works in a cyberpunk kind of background. We've got the face. We've got the Mercenary. A Sprawl Ganger. Again, looks a bit odd, but I kind of, kind of forgive that because the beard is what makes it look a bit odd, and people can have really strange facial hair these days. Street mage, street samurai, who looks a lot less like a street samurai than I imagine, and more like a mercenary. Street samurai were essentially cybered gang members. Street shaman, who looks very similar to earlier versions of Shadowrun. The tech whiz. Tribal Shaman, Vehicle Rigger, and Weapon Specialist. Then we're on to the skill section itself, going through details about active skills. Skill ratings, how to specialise. We'll leaf through just fairly quickly, but all the standard skills are in there. You know, biotech, demolitions, aircraft skills, various language skills, which are massively important in Shadowrun, because not only do you have the influences of Japanese culture, like in other cyberpunk games, but you've got the elven nations and um, sort of the tribal nations, the American Indian nations, which have started retaking North America. Armor, detailing what it's like, racism, a very important part of Shadowrun, although a bit lessened in this edition. Etiquette, how to use stealth, knowledge skills, complementary skills, skill ratings table. Then we're on to the combat section, detailing how initiative works. Dice pools, I think I've skipped a few pages there. Yep, just how the initiative works. 
or nature spirits firing weapons because this version really did start to detail what you could do as full actions and partial actions allowing a much more tactical version of combat that's one of the rule improvements which was massive in this edition surprise ranged combat how to work that out I don't like that all weapons have the same ranges for their type, so a light pistol, no matter what, will always have the same ranges as any other light pistol. I do like having some variety between guns, but it does make sense that a light pistol won't have the range of a sniper rifle. We've got different modes, so guns can fire in semi-automatic burst fire and they have different effects. We've got different types of rounds, so gel rounds, flechette rounds, tracer rounds shotguns very heavy on how different uh, types of guns work then we're on to melee combat Let's keep skipping through um, doctoring then we're on to the vehicles and drones section just quickly going through there those how sensors work active passive sensor sensor tests um, vehicle combat and how that connects to ordinary combat um, all the sort of vehicle maneuvers and things which are really good for chases and then we're on to repairing vehicles vehicle gunnery some quite nice artwork there again a bit cartoon like though um, what else we got? Nice picture of a drone there. Then we're on to the magic section, which of course is massively important in Shadowrun, because mages are a common part of any Shadowrunning team. Sh uh, shamanic uh, totems, the hermetic tradition, then the adept powers, astral plane and detailing how astral space works. Astral Barriers, some nice colour plates here which I'll leaf through because the sunlight is reflecting on them badly. It says a crazed street samurai grinds schools into the ground, groovy, although he looks a bit Harlequin-like. One of the major NPCs of the Shadowrun universe, meeting Mr. Johnson and friends. Some very nice colour plates, they're just not quite as high quality as the first edition and second edition artwork. And back to the magic section, how spells work, spell pools, conjuring, so creating spirits and elementals, foci, and then we're onto the spell lists and how they work, the different effects of them. And we're onto the matrix, so hacking. Now, unfortunately, Sharon was very slow to catch on to wireless technology. So Decking and hacking in Shadowrun at this point was still really working through the old node system where you would physically plug into a network and then hack different spots through the network to get to your data. Whereas Cyberpunk some eight years before, um, 1990 Cyberpunk 2020 came out, had added wireless. And I don't think it was until fourth or fifth edition that Shadowrun caught up because decking or hacking in the system and we can see it's laid out as nodes although nice 3d representations instead of the old node uh, charts we used to get but decking in shadowrun led to you moving through these hosts until you get to where you need to be meanwhile your team is doing something else and because decking, uh, hacking, happens so much faster with your brain linked in, basically the game grinds to a stop while the decker plugs in and does his stuff. And then he either unplugs or if he's controlling turrets or doors or something, he sits and does nothing while the other players move on. Until they come to the turret that he's taken over or they come to the door that he's opened. But it creates this split system where... The deckers are doing their stuff in cyberspace, meanwhile the party's doing their stuff in reality. And I dislike that. It led to us not really using decking in our games because everybody else is sat around twiddling their thumbs. But once you reach the wireless technology where a decker 
can hack the cybernetics of opposing people. They can hack security cams wirelessly as you go down corridors, remotely access doors, start up cars remotely to distract people and operate machinery to cause distractions. Then they become far more useful. And as I said, Cyberpunk 2020 included that in 1990, but Shadowrun took a very long time to catch up. And this uh, edition is still in the old one, which I don't like. And I noticed the Terminator RPG, which is just coming out at the moment, uses that kind of version of computer hacking. And I was very, very disappointed. Now, I know this is supposed to be a cyberspace persona, you know, their avatar in cyberspace, but that's just silly artwork. I think they just saw one of their artists had drawn something a bit silly and were like, yep, that'll fill some space. Doesn't really suit the tone at all. And we're dealing with ICE, system operations, different programs that you can run on your cyber deck. It's all very nicely done, but as I said, I find uh, the Matrix to be problematic in Shadowrun. Let's keep flicking through. We're coming towards the end here. Running the shadows, so going through some other rooms, security systems, um, door and window alarms, various... Uh, security things which players will have to breach, fencing the loot, so once they've stolen some stuff, how to get rid of it, um, security on cred sticks, so when they steal money off somebody, how easy it's going to be to get access to that money, because everybody's holding it in secured uh, data chips, lifestyles, so where your Shadowrunner lives, run to beyond the shadows, so spending your karma, basically the experience system to improve your character, um, karma pools, which are the way Shadowrun did of... In first edition Shadowrun, you would get your karma, which you could spend to improve dice rolls, or you could spend to improve skills at the end of an adventure. But nobody would ever keep karma aside for wasting away to improve a single dice roll. So second edition and beyond kept karma pools, where a percentage of your karma automatically went into the pool, which gave you automatic rerolls. Which did kind of change the tone of the game, because it meant that your re-rolls weren't a once-in-a-lifetime thing where you would burn your karma away. It would be in your pool, and you could use it every session or every adventure. Anyway, we've gone through poisons, we're on to contact, so what's the word on the street, Jimmy? You know, all the different people you know, and we'll help you research. So we've got mechanics here, we've got fixers, we've got bartenders, the usual array. For a moment I thought he looked very Vincent Price, but I can see that he doesn't have a moustache. Spirits and dragons, we've got different creatures here. The dragons, various spirits, known great dragons detailing them. And then we're on to the equipment section, we're getting really close to the back here. Now, one of the things I really don't like this edition is there are no pictures for the equipment, really. We've got this generic picture of a Shadowrunner, which looks very nice. But what's the difference between the katana and an ordinary sword? When we get onto the gun section here, you know, what's the difference between a Colt American L36 and an Ares Predator pistol? Well, the Ares Predator pistol I've always seen as looking a bit like Robocop's gun. But there's nothing here to let you know that. There's no images at all. And this is just worsened as you go on. Because we go through all the equipment here, different types of ammunition, different types of clothing and armor, um, entertainment stuff, electronics. Shadowrun is very much a shopping game where you get money and you improve your character by buying lots of stuff, which gives them bonuses and advantages. So we've got various types of vision enhancement, communication systems, surveillance measures so they can play spy, security devices, skill softs, because you can actually buy artificial improvements to your skills. But again, still no pictures of any equipment. And as I said, we're coming towards the cybernetics. So we don't really know what these do. I did like the illustrations of like dermal plating, so you can see that the physical metal plates under the skin. But there's none of that in this edition. We've got the cyber decks, and then we're on to drones and cars. Now, this is where I think the worst failure of the game is. 
because we have the Eurocar Whiskwin 2000, which is basically a Porsche. It mentions in one of the descriptions that Porsche becomes Eurocar. So it's a very fast, uh, very sporty, very expensive car. But we've got the Ford America here. And all the difference is, is stats. There's no image. You can't see how cool your Westwind 2000 looks in comparison to the America, which is a very boxy family vehicle. Um, and none of the vehicles here, we've got pages of stats, but none of the images. Would it have really hurt to just move these stats in slightly and put in a small thumbnail of the different designs down the edge of the page so people knew what all these vehicles looked like. You didn't have to waste a lot of space. You didn't have to redo the artwork. You've got it all from the old Riggers books. Just very disappointed. As I said, it's the artwork which ruins this edition for me. Um, and now we've got the area where the game's mainly going to be set. So Seattle and the environs around it. We've got the tribal lands which border on it. <coughs> the tier 10 Gaia. We've got the developers say, so the developers saying what they think about the game. We've got source book updates, so going through the different source books and how they connect in. You know, Rigger Book 2, um, Virtual Realities 2. It gives you a clear idea how you can use the older editions with this. Sample character record sheets. And then a very handy index at the back. Now, as I've said, Shadowrun 3rd Edition is a very nice version of Shadowrun. The rules are massively improved over 2nd Edition and a lot clearer. Um, it definitely improved the game in so many ways. But the presentation of the book really put me off, leading to me not really liking this edition much. But if you can put that aside, I highly recommend 3rd Edition. It is a very lovely version of Shadowrun. But anyway, I'm looking at the clock on my camera and I can see I've been going on for absolutely ages. So I'd better end here. Thank you as always for watching. Please like, subscribe and comment down below as it does me massive favours with the YouTube algorithm. But as always, most of all, you just look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now.